my goodness, it got awfully quiet. We got uh, about a minute and 30 seconds. So. Although I think everybody's here that's going to get here. Ah, yeah, I could have tried. I could have tried. Yes, so that's fine. Um, yes, yeah, isn't that nice? That's been uh, for every presentation in the room, I think. Uh, so we're guessing it's a projector, but we're not AV or network. So, yeah. Anyway, hi, my name's Stu Sheldon. You might remember me for such talks. No, I'm not going to do that. My call sign's AG6AG, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about what to do if you just got your amateur radio license. Uh, could I see a show of hands? How many people in the room are licensed? All right, so how many, uh, did, leave your hands up, leave your hands up. Uh, the people that have been licensed longer than a year, let's take our hands down. Okay. All right, the people that got licensed today during the test, right there. Well, oh, all right, congratulations. Way to go. Uh, was, are you, uh, did you upgrade or did you just become a technician today? Congratulations and welcome to the wonderful hobby of amateur radio. Um, so this is going to be old hat to a lot of you guys probably. Um, but uh, we'll go over this. It's not a lot of information. We can go over it fairly quickly. This is the average amateur radio station. <laughs> this will be what you'll be expected to deploy uh, once you, uh, you know, get a little practice in. Uh, and of course, you're going to need some antennas. This is a standard antenna farm for an amateur radio operator. Um, we have a little bit of an issue out here in California. We, we don't have a lot of land. You'll notice that these are really close together. Uh, so we have to deploy a lot of antennas in a small space. And, you know, I'm assuming you folks would really like to get into mobile. <laughs> now, just remember that you need to keep some sort of clear point of view while you're driving. Uh, anyway, that concludes today's presentation. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So let's talk about the old days. Back in the old days, you know, we didn't have the Internet, and we didn't have all the uh, fantastic things that we have today that make it easy for us to take tests and things like that, practice tests. I mean, you know what? Chances are when you first decided in the old days that you wanted to get an amateur radio license, it was because you knew somebody that had one, and they mentored you. They helped you with it. Uh, you may have built receivers long before you went and took that test just to learn the electronic theories. You would have an Elmer, or uh, a uh, mentor as it were, helping you to prepare for the test, working you, working your questions, uh, working the questions out with you. And uh, you know, you'd probably get with local ham groups helping put up antennas and things like that. So by the time you went in to take your test, you had a little bit of experience around radios and RF. And uh, you know, then, then comes taking the test, and I don't want to sound like your grandfather talking here, but you know, you used to have to go down to the FCC field office, uphill, in the snow, both ways. Well, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of times you go down there, and in the old, real old days, they wouldn't even tell you if you passed. You'd basically turn your test in, you'd go home, and a couple months later, either a nice shiny new license would show up in your mailbox, or a letter that said, we're sorry, but you didn't pass. Once you passed, then you got to set up your own station, and back then, a lot of times you were building it. So. Amateur radio has changed a lot, though. These days, you can purchase a book from Amazon, study for a couple of weeks, take a test, and you know what? When you take the test with the VE, they tell you whether you passed or failed. Not only that, they gave you a piece of paper telling you that you passed. And within a couple of weeks, you'd look up your call sign on the FCC website, and you're all set to go. Or maybe, just maybe, you went to a conference like this and somebody dared you to take the test. So you went and you took the test and you passed it. Who knows? The point is that you don't have all of that mentoring that's happening anymore before you go and get that license. So this talk is all about 
Now what? Well, let's start off that first you need a radio. I believe you should start out with an HT or handy talkie as they're known, okay? Now this one right here, this is a Chinese handy talkie. Retails for $25 on Amazon. That's, uh, you know, Amazon Prime price as a matter of fact, okay? This is a Chinese HT. This retails for $500. You won't be buying it on Amazon. You're most likely going to a radio shop to buy it. Now, let's see, $25, $500, first radio, hmm. Well, there's a lot of advantages, by the way, to the $500 radio. However, uh, all those advantages, like the better clarity, the tighter the RF is, the tighter the transmission range is, the lack of emitting spurious signals and everything else, all sorts of great reasons to buy this radio. Okay, but your first radio, I think you should be buying this for 25 bucks. And let me tell you why. Like, this is awesome. Is one of these in your future? Sure it is. Yeah, you get, get in with the hobby and stuff like that? Great. But, I hate to say it, but chances are the first radio is going to end up sitting on the roof of your car and you're going to drive away and it's going to go kaboom. Or you're going to drop it in a puddle of water. Uh, or you're going to program it and somehow you might brick it. That's possible. So for 25 bucks for something that actually works almost as good. As a matter of fact, for most people, not noticeably any better for a first time technician than this $500 radio, I'd say this would be the way to go. Now, so now you have your HT. You get it programmed somehow. We'll go into that a little bit later. So what's the next step? Well, you know, you might want to get a little bit more distance with it. So this, my friends, is a mag mount antenna. And this is not magnetic, so I can't set it there. Now, this little item here, I think uh, Amazon price-wise, I'm guessing about $45. Oh, for me, there we go. Look at that. Thank you, sir. Anyway, this little antenna here will attach directly to your HT, and if, very important, you put it on a pie tin or a cookie sheet so you actually have a ground plane uh, to use it with, your transmit and receive uh, ability is going to improve immensely on that little HT, okay? This is an inexpensive way now to get farther and better reception and transmission out of your little radio. Oh, and by the way, what else is this good for? Anybody tell me? P put it on top of your car? Absolutely. So you put it on top of your car. You get yourself a little uh, microphone to plug into your HT. All of a sudden now you have a little 5-watt mobile radio. You now, for the price of this, which I think uh, this is a Chinese... Uh, uh, microphone, I think this is, I don't know, uh, $5, okay? You now have the ability to use this HT as a mobile radio. You know what, is it perfect? Nah, not really, it, it's good enough though, right? If you're able to get into the repeater and able to talk to people while you're driving around town with your mag mount and your little HT, you're set to go at least for now, right? Well. But, like with all things, we want it better, right? So, let's talk about mobile radios. Mobile radios operate someplace between 25 and 50 watts, typically. Uh, a mobile radio is something that you could actually install in your car permanently, which is really, really cool, because that way, you don't have to worry about unplugging everything and doing the rest of the stuff with your HT, right? Now, the nice part about it is now you have the opportunity to drill a hole in the roof of your car. <laughs> you know, uh, you don't have to do that, by the way. I chose to do that when I uh, installed the mobile in my car and uh, never regretted it, but, uh, you know, it definitely was a decision that I made that my wife was very clear that she thought that wasn't a really good idea, but 
uh, that's fine. Uh, my wife loves amateur radio, by the way, but we won't go into that. She's very tolerant of me, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, now, you got your mobile now. It's all installed. You jump in the car. You've got your mic. You're, 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 you're cruising. You're talking to people on the repeaters. You're getting to know everybody. Now it's time to think about a base station. Well, little secret, VHF, UHF uh, mobiles are the same thing that people use in their house. Okay, They use identical radios. There are a few that uh, are uh, specifically designed to be bases, okay? but for the most part, if you're running an FM uh, mode radio, it's going to be a mobile that you basically plug into a power supply. What makes it do more is the antenna. That's what makes antenna choice so important. Your home antenna is going to be, oh, four and a half to ten feet just for the antenna itself, and you're going to want to put it up on a mass maybe as high as you can get it depending on your zoning. Uh, now, that means you're going to mount something to the side of your house or out the window or something like that, and that can be a little challenging, especially if you have challenging antenna uh, uh, rules okay, or a significant spouse or other that doesn't like antennas. It, but, but um, however, I really want to make this clear. An old ham once told me, the only bad antenna is the one you don't put up. If you don't have an antenna up, you're not talking to anyone, okay? The first six to eight months that I had my amateur radio license, I was bound and determined that I was going to get the most perfect antenna up on my house. And I came to the realism that there's no way I'm ever going to make the perfect antenna. And by the time I got done, I'd probably be on the air by 2025, 2026. So I thought, let's go ahead and get something that works. And that's what I did. And I haven't looked back since. So how many people here love configuring their HT. <laughs> Nobody ever says they love configuring an HT. Let's talk a little bit about that. Now, what's the best way to learn how to configure it, uh, your HT? Read the fine manual. Make sure that you, uh, make sure you read it because there's a lot of little idiosyncrasies to this stuff. Um, Nifty Guide, how many people know what this is? I got a couple show of hands there. This is called a Nifty Guide, uh, mini manual. It's a base, what we call the 80-20 rule, right? 80% uh, of the people will, or, uh, let's see, 80% of what you're looking for is going to be in here, okay? And it probably covers about 20% of the actual manual. But it has quick shortcuts on how to do particular things on your radio. Absolutely an awesome little thing to have for your radio. Google, yeah, go on, do a search. Especially on these little Baofangs, you're going to find all sorts of information on how to program them. Uh, there's also programming software, uh, Chirp, which is really good too. That's an open source product that you can download. All you need to do is get a programming cable, and you can plug right in and program your radio right through Chirp. Now. Where else? Let's say that you run up against a wall, you have a radio and you can't figure out how to program it. Take yourself and your radio to the local amateur radio club in your neighborhood. Go down there on a meeting night and sit there, introduce yourself as a new ham and say, hey, does anybody know how to program this? And I will guarantee that a bunch of people will come and hover around you trying to help you to program this radio. Uh, because that's one thing that's really big in the amateur radio hobby. That's helping each other. Uh, kind of like the open source community. You know, we're all here to help. And that's the real cool part of this. Also, you know what? The buddy system. Hey, maybe you met somebody you took the test with today. Okay? Maybe that can be a relationship that you can develop and basically get to know that person or take the test with a friend. And then help each other learn how to do stuff by working on it together. There's no better way to solve problems than putting two heads against it instead of one. Now, one of the key things that we do with amateur radio is volunteer for a frequency, allowing more people to utilize that frequency. 
The problem is, <clears throat> um, how many people here are old enough to remember Betamax? How many people here owned a Betamax? Yeah, all right. I admit it, I did. Currently, there are four major standards of digital for voice. D-Star, Fusion, DMR, and C4FM. These standards are proprietary, except for DMR, I believe, has been opened up by Motorola. However, each manufacturer came up with their own concept of what they thought would be a good standard. And right now, it's being battled out by the manufacturers. So when I finally threw my Betamax player away, because I couldn't get tapes for it anymore, I realized that I was never going to buy into something that I thought I couldn't guarantee I was buying a product that was going to be around for a while. And based on the fact that we really haven't centralized on a single type of um, data standard for uh, digital voice, I'm not buying into it yet. And right now, you can buy into it if you've got a lot of friends on it and it's worthwhile to you, but if uh, that nobody's involved in it that you know of, I'd probably step back and wait. But it's up to you, because after all, you guys are licensed amateur radio operators now, and you get to make all your own decisions. Anyway, uh, I got IRLP here, which is uh, Internet Relay... Uh, linking protocol, thank you, um, which really isn't what we consider digital in the fashion that we understand of it being turned to digital here on the uh, radio. It actually is digital from the standpoint that it's digitized and pushed across uh, uh, the internet to another repeater in a different state or country or whatever via VOIP. Okay, so uh, and that standard is repeater to repeater, and your radio has nothing to do with that from a digital standpoint. Uh, that actually uh, is really popular, and we used to actually have an IRLP uh, repeater in uh, my uh, little town of the Canal Valley, which uh, since I believe they disconnected the internet connection on it, so it's down right now. We're hoping it's going to come back. Digital data modes. Now, chances are the only thing that you're going to most likely be playing with as a technician is going to be APRS, stands for Automatic Position Reporting System. Uh, PSK31, Olivia, MFSK, uh, uh, Throb, JT65, and FT8, which is really this new and upcoming protocol. If you haven't heard about it, look, look it up on the internet. Um, they are uh, all pretty much single sideband, and like I said, it, the, the value of buying a sideband all-mode radio uh, before you get a general license or better probably isn't a great prospect. Uh, you notice I skipped over packet. Packets used still in uh, MCOM or emergency communications, and uh, that's something that you would probably use on FM. Okay, um, you need a TNC to do that. The barrier to entry is really having other people that are running packet in a uh, place that you can get to them via simplex. All right, so I threw APRS out there, our automatic packet radio system. Now, you see this? This is an actual track. I was running a APRS position radio in my vehicle um, when I was doing an event, basically a bike ride, one of those event, events you volunteer for. Well, this is my day, chasing out after people on bicycles for the entire day, trying to keep them safe, making sure that I was around and others like me were around if something went wrong or they needed help to get back to an aid station. Now the reason that you run something like this, an event like that, is kind of kind of neat. Uh, this is managed by a centralized net control, so we basically are given an assignment to drive around, and then if they need us, they call us on the radio and have us go someplace. But if all the vehicles have this in their cars during the event, and they get a call about a problem, let's say over here, they can look on this map and say, okay, who's the closest? And send that person. And basically, it really gets you onto the site fast. Uh, there's a lot of other things you can do with APRS. 
Uh, you can do um, uh, send. You can send messages back and forth. Uh, weather stations will broadcast weather information also via APRS. So there's a lot of fun things you can do with that. But I think the most common use that we see, at least in uh, in my community, is using it for position tracking. On oh, balloon tracking, yes, sir. If you were trying to find a weather balloon or something like that, or uh, just a balloon that you sent up that uh, you had your baby in or something, and the baby, yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, so now you know all about this stuff, and you got your radio all set, and it's all programmed, and you know it's programmed right. Well, what do you do if nobody can hear you? Well, let's talk about the reality of HTs. Remember we talked about this mag mount. See this little antenna? Check this out. This is a quarter wave, two meter antenna. Over here on the table, this is a quarter wave, two meter antenna. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that the wire is wrapped around to be the same length as that quarter wave there basically making this antenna semi-worthless. I'm not going to say it's completely worthless, but you know, um, you need to have a realistic expectation or, of what this HT can do. Uh, don't get discouraged if you can't open a repeater or talk to someone when you initially flip this on. Um, there's some uh, other things that can happen. I mean, take a look. In this building, I'm surrounded by concrete, right? Reinforced concrete. and I go to talk to somebody, I'm probably not going to make it out of this building, and if I do, I'm not going to make it very far after that. Um, and some areas, I hate to say it, are just radio did. Uh, there's, uh, when I first moved, uh, got my radio at my house, I could stand, there's a place I can stand in my backyard, literally, with an HT in my hand, and try to talk and no one will hear me. Right? I can move this far over and talk, and they'll hear me. So there are spots that are dead. And again, even though you think you got it programmed right, until you actually talk to somebody, <laughs> you don't know if you got it programmed right. Okay, So you need to get back to that buddy system I was talking about, or go out and be able to test it at one of the club meetings. Now, how about the solutions? How about take your radio, go outside, see if it works out there. That's the easiest. Remove a little bit. Other option, get a more powerful radio. Right? This is 5 watt radio. You can buy 8 watt radios. You can buy mobile radios that are 50 watts. There are radios out there that are 100 watts. You can buy linears and add them on the end of it to get even more wattage. <sighs> However, you'd probably be better off just going out and getting a better antenna. Because a better antenna does two things. It doesn't just make your transmissions go farther. It allows you to hear more people. You know, it's great if you can blast out and send a signal all the way out to the other side of town, but if somebody trying to answer you can't hear you, or you can't hear them, then there isn't much use of that, other than you just be an annoyance to everybody because they keep calling you and you don't answer them, right? Um, and again, get some help with programming. That nine times out of ten, programming is the problem. There's something that's wrong in your setup, and there's lots of places to get help with that. So, a lot of people have antenna restrictions. We talked about that. So, this is a friend of mine, Shaq. You'll see over here, this is actually one of those little uh, studio apartment refrigerators, and he, he lives in a one-room apartment. Um, he's got five mag mount antennas on top of his refrigerator. They are hooked to five radios, by the way. He's got one that's running packet. He's got another one that's running 220. He's got another one that's running... Uh, uh, two meter. One of them is actually hooked to a DMR radio, um, and he uses them all. And he does this because he lives in a studio apartment, for God's sakes. He he doesn't have a choice. He has no place to mount an antenna. He doesn't even he doesn't even have an attic or a balcony. Speaking of speaking of that, though, your mag mount would work on top of your fridge, on top of a filing cabinet, on top of a pie tin on top of a cookie sheet. You could even put that mag mount on an old computer, which uh, is what you want to do, is put something magnetic on something that stores digital information magnetically. But we won't go there. 
that, I have a funny story about that that I'm not going to share because there's litigation still going on. Uh, <laughs> now, speaking of addicts, check this out. This is a two meter J pole this guy is stuck in his attic. <clears throat> and this I pulled up off the web, it was in how, a how to on the web. And the guy said, you know what? This is every bit as good as the antenna that I had on the roof of my other house as far as reception and transmission goes. Um, you know, he moved into a uh, antenna restricted HMO and this was his solution. Here's a guy that runs HF. This is a four band uh, dipole, right? There's uh, uh, the ballon right there. And all these wires, one wire on each side is for a different band. Okay, this is also in the attic. Very, very elegant solution if you have access to the attic. Yes? So, uh, I heard they're like, uh, these, how would that classes say, you know, like some neighborhoods that say you can't put an antenna anywhere else. Outside, that's correct. Well, then I even heard from some communities like in, like, uh, I don't know where I got it from. There are even communities that say you can't even put an antenna inside your attic, right? If you have access to your attic, and you own a home in a uh, in a uh, in an HOA or something like that. Um, it's your attic. They can't tell you what you can or can't put in the attic because it's not visible. And even you know, I'm not telling anybody to break an HMO, but um, I I don't know any HMO that's going to walk up to me and say, okay, we're going to inspect your attic. <laughs> you know, I think I'd probably throw them out on their ear and said, you can talk to my lawyers, but. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. If they can't see it, they don't know it's there. Okay? I know what you're doing, whether you're working in the common area or you're working in the north area. Correct. And that's, the, yeah, you may not be able to put anything in the attic, period. Okay? It, antenna is irrelevant at that point. That would be anything in the attic, period. Right. Now, how about a balcony? So, you don't need to make this a permanent structure. This is a magnetic loop antenna. And this little item here points out over there, it's directional. And this is usually used for HF. So uh, uh, this would be something you'd use on, oh, probably 15 or 20 meters, okay? You look over here, here's a really nice vertical coming off uh, this guy's balcony's, um, uh, oh, whatchamacallit, uh, railing, right? Little uh, matching box there. Uh, could be two meters, could be six meters, could be HF, kind of hard to tell. This is something though that you don't have to permanently put up. It's something you could toss up while you're operating and then take it back down. Very seldom will an HMO have anything to say about temporary structures that are not up over 24 hours, okay? And if things are really that bad and you can't do this and you can't get into your attic, okay, do what my friend did. Tie a wire to their rain gutter and load the rain gutter. Okay, you know, you're all laughing. You think this is funny. This guy's talked to Germany, Italy. He's talked to Japan using a rain gutter. Okay, all right. So, you know what, don't give up. Don't give up. Which, you know, is a great segue into not giving up. Let's talk about emergency communications, okay? We call them MCOM. Um, the one neat part about emergency communications is it's pretty much open to everybody. Uh, Amateur Radio Emergency Services, or ARIES, uh, that is a national organization that is uh, centrally uh, administered by ARRL, but the national organization has regional management. So you're actually going to tie in to uh, someone in your local area that's going to be the manager for the uh, uh, ARIES group in your area. Um, the, uh, it requires, sometimes it requires training. I'm not going to say it never requires training. Uh, sometimes it does, but uh, any amateur operator with a license is eligible to participate in this. Uh, and if you happen to be around for Ben's talk, there's a really good reason to get involved in this, and we'll go into that in just a second. Uh, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services, or RACES, is usually activated by local or civic government 
in the event of a disaster or, uh, all right, so I'm a product of the Cold War. So we'll just say, you know, this, this kind of all tied into the old uh, duck and cover emergency. Uh, uh, Russia has launched the missiles sort of thing. But now it's earthquakes, mudslides, fires. We're activated for that now on a much more regional level. Um, local government is who tosses out the activation. It goes by many other names, many acronyms. Ventura County, we're uh, members of ACS, or the Auxiliary, Auxiliary Communication Service, uh, which is actually a statewide acronym, which is controlled by the Ventura County Sheriff's Department. But uh, DCS is what's in LA County. Uh, RACES is every place else. But they also have different names in different portions in different counties all over the place. So uh, you need to get with your uh, a, uh, ARIES uh, coordinator, and they will tell you about the next step up. Uh, this may require all sorts of stuff. Uh, ACS requires background checks, requires you to complete courses uh, in FEMA and uh, other stuff. Some may require you to uh, learn uh, first aid. Uh, I think DCS requires you to go to a driving school or something, so, uh, you know, so you can drive police cars, I guess. So there's all sorts of different things that are involved in emergency communication. So why is that important? Well. I think Ben uh, really summed it up well. Uh, he, talks, he talked about Dominica and uh, the issue with uh, uh, the hurricane that hit Hurricane Maria and how they received uh, a help call from a uh, ham radio operator that they did not recognize the call sign. Uh, it turned out to be a false call, but since they didn't recognize the call sign, um, you know, it didn't carry the same weight in that emergency. Okay, now what that really means is this. Aries and Races has usually weekly or monthly nets that you would check into. Um, checking into a net is fairly simple. Uh, it's usually a formal net, uh, and it's a great way to test your radio. Check into the net and see if people can hear you. That's uh, one of the most awesome things about the net is it makes sure that the people that you're going to want to talk to in an emergency can hear what you're telling them. Another thing to remember is it's a good way to get your call sign out there, okay? Get the people that are in MCOM in your community to recognize who you are. So in the event of that earthquake, flood, disaster, whatever, mudslide, giant forest fire, uh, you know, alien zombie invasion, okay? You'll be able to pick the radio up. You'll be able to check in, call in to the uh, uh, Aries or Aries net, and they're going to recognize your voice. They're going to recognize your call sign and know that you're a real ham, okay? Know that you're a member of the community, okay? That is really important when you need help. Okay, uh, the, the old saying is believe but verify when you get this information. Well, you've already got verification that you're who you say you are and people know who you are. Okay, so and not only that, but it's simple to check in. If you don't know how to check into the net, listen to a couple people in front of you and just imitate what they're doing. Use your call sign, of course. If you use theirs, it would probably be problematic, but uh, <laughs> you never know. Um, Anyway, so yes, in an emergency, you will be a known operator. In an emergency, uh, you will know where to tune because they will tell you in that, those areas and that you check in, tune into this frequency in the event of an emergency. And it's also a great way to meet other operators because you know what? That is what this hobby is all about. This hobby is all about going and meeting other operators and participating in these events and learning the science of radio. Um, and, I mean, how many people here were members of Lugs, right? Okay, did you enjoy it when you go to the Lug meeting? A lot of fun, right? A lot of interaction, you learn new stuff. That's what it's like going to an amateur radio club meeting. They have talks, it's a lot of fun. And 
volunteering for events. You get to check your equipment out. And again, this is another way to meet all those people that are involved in those emergency organizations. So uh, I got to tell you, if you do anything, get out to the clubs. Meet other hams. They're there to help you. That's what they want to do. You know, one of my favorite things is contesting. I'm sure if you studied for your technician license or if you currently have a license, you know what contesting is. Uh, VHF, UHF contests, you know, you run simplex only on them, but it's, it's really easy to get a couple contacts in the log. And you'll be helping some of these, uh, you know, old farts like me that like to go out and contest and turn their logs in to get awards, okay? Um, it's a great way to learn about antennas, and you can even enter it with your handy talkie for gosh sakes. You can stand in your backyard on your handy talkie on Simplex and make a QSO, maybe with somebody in the neighborhood you don't even know, okay? And guess what? You can even turn that QSO in in your log for the contest. I know, well, you know, you laugh. Um, a friend of mine said he had like four QSOs in one of these contests. And he happened to turn his log in. He was like second in the county, right? You know, so it's, it's worthwhile. Um, and like I said, a great way to learn about antennas because now you're going to want to figure out how to, I want to build a Yagi, right? Two-meter Yagis are easy to build. Directional antennas. Get up on top of the hill. Aim that thing like a rifle. Just make sure there's no police around. And you'll have your radio attached to it, and you'll be able to just aim it at a particular community, hit the button, and talk, right? And you're going to be able to go maybe eight, ten times farther with a directional antenna, right? And the same thing, you can move it around and all of a sudden you'll hear somebody talking. You move it away, you don't hear them anymore? Well, you know they're over there. And if it's somebody you're mad at, you'll be able to find them. All right, anyway, kidding, I'm just kidding. Okay, HF contests, most are worldwide and have a high participation. Um, there are some contests, such as the biggest contest in amateur radio, Field Day. Field Day is, uh, and Vern uh, Potter back there is going to correct me, but I believe it is the third weekend? Last weekend in June. Last weekend in June. So if June was really short, it would be the third weekend in June. No, it's the last weekend in June. And uh, it is tons of fun. Um, uh, the first year I got my license, I went to Field Day. I sat down. Uh, on a 40 meter station and I pounded away for three or four hours and just fell in love with it. It made me fall in love with contesting. And it's awesome. It's 24 hours of going out in nature and setting antennas up and hooking up stations and <laughs> it is great. It is awesome. It's so much fun. Um, now, typically we use single sideband or CW, right, continuous wave, and digital data modes for these contests uh, on HF. So you can take any kind of uh, structure at it that you want. Um, and you can win some cool awards, get some nice wallpaper. Well, they call them certificates. But, um, and it's a great way to get a bunch of other contacts and get those contacts awards. Right? So it's all part about being part of the team. Uh, now, everybody here knows what the term Elmer means, right? All right. So uh, I know what Elmer is. Okay. All right. Well, the term Elmer means someone who provides personal guidance and assistance to current or would-be hams. Now, that doesn't mean that this is a guy that has an extra license that's been a ham for 45 years that talks in a crusty sailor voice, okay? Uh, if you are more knowledgeable about something than someone else is, you can be their Elmer for whatever that thing is, whatever they're asking about. Remember, people, we are all Elmers as amateur radio operators. We're all here to help each other. And that's the most important thing that I think you need to take away from my talk is everybody is all on the same team. And with that, questions? Not one question. I covered everything. Yeah. What's the farthest you ever got simplex on an HD? 
Um, the parts I ever got, Simplex on an HT. <sighs> Let's see, I was on a hilltop, and I'm, if I remember correct, 45 or 50 miles. Would you believe the Oregon border to Santa Barbara? I could believe that, but on an HT, I'd have trouble believing that. Ah, uh, well. Okay, yeah. All right. I'll, I'll I'll give you that one. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. don't know anything about that. Um, it may have been an issue that it violated part of their uh, oh, business copyright or trademark stuff. I don't know. Um, I don't have an answer. As I heard, like, there was an organization that hated the reason that could not open and explain to the government that there's like, at the time, I heard like the, the local ham radio group is fighting well, so we live here in America. In America, we can spend our money any way we want. And the government's not going to tell me how to spend my money, although they try to take it all every year, uh, making it impossible for me to spend it. But that being said, um, you know, whether or not something is open source or free software or an open standard, uh, although I wish that we do have an open standard with digital, I understand that it's my choice if I want to go with a proprietary standard that I can do that. And lots of people do that. Uh, thank God in America we're allowed to, right? But bottom line is this. Um, Eventually, they are going to settle on a standard. If I had to bet, I'd say it'd be DMR because it's the most open standard. But that would be a bet. I have no idea. And okay, well that's interesting. Although I don't think it qualifies as encrypted because the keys are published. Well, anyway, so that's an interesting thing too. I mean, encryption—that's another issue. Yes. listen to anything you want. Uh, am I breaking FCC no. If you're attempting to, to uh, if you're attempting, let's see, if you are attempting to break encryption, encrypted radio transmissions, then yes, you're breaking the law. If it's encrypted, the act of trying to decrypt it without a legal access to the key makes it illegal. And let me take him first and I'll get to you. Yes. Awesome. Oh my God! You know, recommending radios isn't really a recommendation. It's more of a religious meeting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> amen. Can I hear an amen? Um, one thing I will tell you is this: um, I happen to like Yesu radios. Why? I have no idea. I just happen to like AC radios. Um, I like their price point. Uh, I'm used to their programming, stuff like that. Now, um, the first radio I bought that was a HF unit was an all band. It was the uh, uh, oh, uh, FT991, uh, which was uh, which basically is uh, 40, uh, 440 all the way down to uh, oh, uh, 160 meters. And uh, awesome radio. Absolutely, it, it, it's, it's the jack of all trades. Unfortunately, it was the master of none, 
okay? But it, it's a good radio, don't get me wrong, and it's a great starter radio, and it's everything that you need in a box. But you know what? Kenwood makes one, right? So does ICOM. There's arguments that ICOM makes a better radio than Yesu. Uh, I, I don't know, right? So. Right. Well, I understand your problem, too, because it's really difficult to make that decision. Um, I'd look at what you can afford, okay? That's the biggest thing is what's your budget, you know? Are you going to buy used or are you going to buy new? If you're going to buy used, well, it, you may want a particular radio, but nobody may sell them, right, used because they're so awesome. You may have to pick another radio. So that's something to look at, too. The only suggestion that I make is go ahead and you do an all band. Uh, yes, real quick. You see how I said it was religion? <laughs> I bet you we could pull the room. Give me one second. He was up next. Well, typically we're using uh, analog lines to go in and configure like, uh, you know, uh, re uh, repeaters and stuff on mountaintops. There are stipulations for out-of-band configuration, things like space station uh, radios, for example, or um, uh, satellite radios. We are allowed to use encryption uh, for uh, configuration only, even as a ham, yeah. Okay, there are special things that we do. Uh, it's not perfect, okay? And I wish we could do more encryption because I think it would open us up quite a bit. I had one more in front of you, right? You right there, sir, in the blue. Right, you don't necessarily have to manage something under Part 97. Yes, sir, in the blue coat. $25 HT, yes. <laughs> Although, you know, to be fair, um, you have a lot more capabilities. Okay. So, uh, you know, for a new radio, I could, uh, let's see, the low bar in the Yesu line, I don't remember the exact part number, but I think it's brand new at about six and a half, six fifty. Uh, there's, uh, there, I, I have a quad band that uh, retails for about 350, that's all FM, that's 10, 6, uh, 2, and uh, 440, uh, that's my mobile. Uh, I didn't pay that. If you aren't in a hurry and you watch the pricing, uh, I'll tell you that some of the manufacturers have amazing sales to get rid of overstock, especially coming up on Christmas, which was really kind of surprising. Some of the best pricing on radios is in November. I have not figured that one out. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. No, okay. Yes, sir. Good point. By the way, uh, if you know all the information about that, please share the address and everything because I don't have that handy. Just Google it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I will...
so I will, I will, uh, I'll share with you guys. Um, I went and took my technician license. I live out in uh, uh, the Canal Valley, Thousand Oaks. And uh, I went and took my technician test down here at Huntington Memorial. A month later, I was, I didn't know, I, I was in the same situation after I took my technician test. I had my little white piece of paper and uh, I looked at my wife and realized I have no idea what I'm going to do with this little white piece of paper. I kind of did it on a dare. Uh, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, you, why aren't you doing this? A month later, I went to the TRW swap meet and that's where I took my general test and got my general there. So, uh, <laughs> I'm glad the mic didn't pick that up. <laughs> My wife may be listening. Yes, sir. What's the, if I'm building a antenna, what's the simplest antenna? Dipole. Dipole antenna is the simplest antenna to build. Absolutely. Two pieces of wire connected at the center, split across the primary and the, uh, the shield. Um, it is uh, the, and by the way, uh, that's what I use on HF. That's all I got is a dipole. I have a vertical that's terrible compared to my dipole. My, my dipole is awesome. So, yes, dipole is the simplest antenna. All you got to do is do a half wave, quarter on each side. Um, and, by the way, that's one of the most fun parts of this hobby, too, is building antennas. That's about all that's left for us. I mean, I don't solder surface mount real well, so uh, I'm not building radios, but uh, I am having a good time playing with antennas. Any other questions? All right, well, I think we burned an hour up anyway, and I will bet you that uh, the guys uh, over in uh, uh, AV are just dying to tear this room down. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you listening to me. Oh, you're welcome.